Okay, so first is why outside? Well, we all know the primary risk, right? Indoor floods. RPZs are designed to dump water right at their feet, right? And every time we see an RPZ inside that's three inches or larger, we probably can assume that someday they're going to have a flood, right? All right. Here's what the, the uh, ASPE Plumbing Engineering Design Handbook says. Now know this, that there is no guideline in either the, the UPC or the IPC plumbing code that says you should ever worry about putting a drain under an RPZ larger than, than two, four inches. Nothing, okay? Before an RPZ is located, consideration should be given to both how much water will be discharged and where it will drain. Consideration must be given to the drain system to assure the drainage system can handle the load. If a drain is not capable of accepting the flow, other choices as to the location of the valve, such as outside, should be made. Now, that's been in there since 2006, and so the first thing that I try to do with, with engineers is what they all need most is really what's the worst case scenario, right? As a designer, if I'm engineering a solution, then I need to know what, what's the worst thing that can happen, because that's what I really have to design for, right? So we walk them through a few things. Now, we start by saying, you know, when an RPZ shuts off and the demand ceases, many times that water that's between those two relief valves will flow out in the relief valve. It doesn't always happen. It depends on kick and diam the, the dynamics inside that hydraulic system. But a lot of times that thing gurgles out water. Now, most plumbing engineers, guys, think that that's the only thing an RPZ is designed to ever do. That's the extent of the water that will ever come out of that valve. <laughs> and that's why it's there. Right? Well, so I walk them through a couple of scenarios. Now, what's the worst case scenario? First of all, let's consider, you know, let's say you've got a little blockage. Could be anything in that number two check valve. Well, what's going to happen? Let's see. Well, everything's fine until we lose pressure on the supply side. Now, if that, thing can, if that number two valve can't shut, what's going to happen? Everything's coming back out. Sure. That's right. And if this is a four-story building, it's a lot of water. It's a lot of water fast. Okay. Now, let's think about a failure of the number one check valve. Now, under normal circumstances, we might not ever know that is failed because as they seek demand, they get it. Right? Well, let's, let's consider something. While, while when you lose that first number one check valve, your hydraulics kind of get a little imbalance from time to time and you get bounce, right? Well, that gives opportunity for that relief valve to, to shut, flutter and you're likely to capture something that will hold that thing open. Now, let's say at the end of the day they go home. Now, everything that the water system has to offer to that, that customer is now going to flow out into the relief valve unabated until somebody comes and turns it now, off. Here's another situation. This is a, happens to be a hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a four-story hospital. You see a little <laughs> Wilkins 4, what is that, 375? Is that what that is? Yeah, Wilkins 375. It's not, the Wilk not Wilkins' fault, right? Right here next to it, you got what? Typical four-inch drain. One day, this 375 started dumping like it's supposed to do. Well, the water pressure and the water volume pushed this wall off of its stud and into the next room, which happened to be a telephone and low-voltage wiring closet. It cost about a million dollars. The, the casualty carrier sought recovery from all the usual suspects, the contractor, the subcontractor, the plumber, the engineer, architect, and even the most recent tester. But guess what? The tester was the only one that was exonerated because he showed up with records that reflected he'd been there three months ago and it worked perfectly at that time. Now we don't know who paid what, but we do know that the casualty carrier was made whole from one or more of those remaining defendants. And this is happening a whole lot more than it used to. CNA, and um, Liberty Mutual are leading the charge to write new, co new guidelines for how to rec recover these losses. Many times in the past, most times in the past, they were simply written up as a pipe rupture, or a plumbing failure. But these have consequences because of where they are. All right, so let's take a quick look at that, 
this is the relief valve discharge rate chart for that Wilkins 375 I was just showing you previous shot. It shows what that sucker will do at various pipe sizes up here and at various pressures. <coughs> we see that you know, if we use an 85, which is a pretty rational overnight pressure, uh, the 4 inch, which fits into this category, flows 375 gallons a minute. That's 4 inch. 300, I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. Anybody know what a 4 inch drain will clear? So a 4 inch drain set on a 1% 1, 1 grade, which is typical, and if you consider it at full pipe volume, which is ridiculous, unless you're under pressure and head, you'll get 92 gallons of water to dismiss a minute. That's clean water, full pipe. The reality is more like 50, but let's use 92. So if we're at 375 gushing and we're draining 92 gallons, then we're flooding at a rate of 282 gallons a minute. Am I right? So this guy finally said all this stuff better than I did two summers ago. His name's David DeBoard. He was the president of the Chicago chapter of ASPE when he wrote this white paper. And now he's the head of the education division of ASPE. <clears throat> and he asked me to, uh, to do, uh, he and uh, a guy from here, you guys probably know him, Chris Phillips. He's, uh, he's the head of ASPE in the Central Texas chapter and uh, works at um, Jacobs. Well, anyway, I'll get to that in a second. So David did the math on all this stuff, and he said, look, I, while, while I was using those Wilkins tables, he's using the Watts tables in this particular chart, and he calls out what he says is our flood rates for the 2.5 and 3-inch model after the drain is included of 219 gallons a minute, and then a flood rate after the drain is included for anything larger than 3 inches of 482 gallons a minute flooding. He goes on to conclude that with respect to indoor RPZs, the floor drain capacity of RPZs of 3 inch diameter and higher are likely to be cost prohibitive due to the necessary pipe diameter and fall rates. That's sort of a duh, yeah. But finally when he said it, the plumbing engineers may have to listen. What's well, another reason for not putting it outside? And this may surprise you. Um, this is something that we've recently taken up with architects in their AI learning system and it has been astonishing at how they just haven't looked at it this way before and I don't know why. Um, so revenue and property value. In, indoor RPZs reduce the rentable square footage of a, a building and that reduces the revenue and the property value and that may seem silly to sta state, it's obvious, right? But we, I went around and I did some, some clearance uh, calculations from various cities to see what the average size clearance requirements are from about six or seven cities. I, suff uh, I did this up in Suffolk, that's Long Island. Uh, this is for a three inch RPZ. Again, a very small solution. Obviously we know that these things grow exponentially when we get into bigger pipe sizes, but we're just talking about a three inch. So all these cities, I did the measurements, you come up with an average of 33 and a third feet, square feet. Well, how much does that really cost a property owner to give up? to put an RPZ. Well, we did this this way, the old financial way. If you think, think annual rent on a class A office building is $30 a square foot, that's a grand a year. Well, if I take that 25 year cash flow and I want to find out what the net present value of today for that, that $34,000 is, I would, and I want a 9% return on my investment, I'll, I'll exchange $12,156 for that. In other words, if you'll give me $12,156, I'll give up that space. But if you won't give it to me, I need to figure out a better solution. So, landlord has lost this amount of the value. So, if the space is recaptured with rental value, what will my alternative cost be? Will placing the system outside cost more or less than $12,156? If it's less, well then how much less? Because I need it to be quite a bit because I really hate to look at that box outside. Right? Well, let's, let's analyze this really quickly. So, option A would be the old conventional inline backflow preventer that you see sitting out in front of properties. Now, I know down here in South Texas, you don't often deal with, uh, with enclosures. <coughs> Every other corner of the globe just about has to. I would argue that this, out, this area needs to, 
because you do have 17 degree days, right? All right. So, and vandalism and protection. So yeah, sure. So if you're if you're a designer, you're thinking about what is going to end up, and you got to look at okay, the conventional means I got to buy this, for, even just for my small. But it's it's 72 by 38 by 22 inches. It's 60,000 cubic inches of space, and it costs 3,266 dollars with heat. Now, that's just the box. That's not the assembly, right? But I've, you got to do that either way. Exactly. So I've muted that. You got to put it inside. You got to put it outside. You got to put it somewhere. So let's just not even worry about that. Now, that's option A. Well, how about option B? How about an N-type model? The, new, the same manufacturer. It's 957, but it's the N-type. Well, look at the enclosure that fits around that one. That thing is only 46 by 38 by 19. It's half of the cubic inches, 33,000 cubic inches. And it costs about a third <coughs> of what the other one does. Which one do you want on your property? That's kind of a no-brainer, right? I want the littler one. So let's walk this on out. If I add my pad, which is a grand, and if I add, run a line to it for heat, it's another 1800 bucks. I come up with a cost of $3,920. It's quite a bit less than $12,156. Now, let's say I'm just a morbid hater of all things nice and pretty, and I want the big ugly one. It's still slightly more expensive pad, otherwise the same, $6,266. Still half the cost of putting it inside and losing that net rentable square footage. Don't be, don't be amazed that architects and property owners care that much about every single net rentable square feet. They do. And then you move a wall and you make money. And it's that simple. So it's very important to think about those things. So basically here's the deal. I can either, I can put $3,920 plus an assembly like that. I can put $6,266 plus an assembly and do that. Or I can leave it inside and it cost me $12,156. So that's the, I mean, there's no comparison. Everybody kind of worries about whether or not it doesn't cost money to put it outside. It's far more efficient financially to put it outside, okay? Now, there's one other deal that property owners deal with. We've only been talking about cash flow, but when you actually relate it to the value of the property because of those cash flows and you rate it at a cap rate that's rational for new construction office buildings over time, you're going to gain $18,000 of new property value when you go to sell it that you didn't have before. That's, all, that's after all that cash flow you've saved. So anyway, all right, so why outside? You eliminate indoor flood hazards and you increase cash flow and property value. 